Good afternoon and welcome everyone. I believe this is my signal to begin. Uh, my name is Beverly Hale and I'm the Associate Vice President Research for the Agri-Food Partnership at the University of Guelph. On behalf of the University, it is my great pleasure to welcome you all to this event focused on harvesting data at Ontario's Agri-Food Research Centres. These agricultural research centres are located across the province in traditional Indigenous territories. We offer our gratitude to the lands on which the University of Guelph campuses Guelph, Ridgetown, and Guelph Humber are situated and to the Indigenous ancestors who have inhabited these lands for centuries. We recognize that our campuses are located on the lands of the dish with one spoon wampum, and we offer our respect to the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Delaware Nation at Moravian Town, Six Nations of the Grand River, and the diverse communities of First Nations, Inuit and Métis, peoples who reside on these lands. As we come together in this distanced fashion, uh, you may be located in a different part of Ontario or across the country, and I encourage you to seek out the Indigenous history of your area. I am pleased to share this virtual stage with Jen Liptrot, Director of the Research and Innovation Branch at the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Ontario's agri-food research centers are owned by the province of Ontario through its agency, the Agriculture Research Institute of Ontario, and managed by the University of Guelph through the Ontario Agri-Food Innovation Alliance. The Alliance is the public face of the long-term collaboration between OMAFRA and the U of G, dedicated to supporting the successes and sustainability of Ontario's agri-food and rural se sectors. Please join me in welcoming Jen Liptrot to deliver opening remarks for this afternoon's event. Hi, Bev. Hello, everyone. Thank you. As Bev noted, the Ontario Agri-Food Innovation Alliance is a collaboration between the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs, or OMAFRA, and the University of Guelph. It goes back more than 125 years through which the Ontario government and the university have worked together to support and help shape the future of the province's agri-food industry and rural communities. This partnership and the province's investment in research and innovation is critical for continued growth in the body of knowledge, data, and innovation necessary to not only achieve assurance in food safety, to protect animal, plant, and public health and the environment, to grow Ontario's capacity to produce food, and also to support a globally and domestically competitive agri-food sector. To achieve this growth, the OMAFRA U of G partnership is committed to increasing access and sharing of data to facilitate new agri-food and rural research and data analytics to inform decision-making. The Research Station Data Access Portal, which we'll learn about today, is part of the new data infrastructure at the Ontario Agri-Food Research Centers the network of research centers, which Bev mentioned earlier, and which are owned by the government of Ontario through its agency, the Agricultural Research Institute of Ontario, or AREO, as we call it. AREO invests in these spaces because they're critical to research advancement and bringing innovation to Ontarians. And the strong relationship among AREO, the ministry, and the University of Guelph ensures the research stations are built, optimized, and maintained, to accommodate future-facing, demand-driven research and innovation that benefits all Ontarians. I hope you enjoy hearing about the new research station data access portal in Alora and how the data is being used to inform dairy and beef research. Thanks, Bev. Back over to you. Thank you very much, Jen, for those comments. And as Jen noted, one of the objectives of the Ontario Agri-Food Innovation Alliance is to enhance data management and stewardship to support the agri-food and rural sectors. Uh, enhanced data practices of this kind are a priority for many funding organizations, including the Tri Agency, which recently released its research data management policy. Enhanced data manage management practices combined with improved data infrastructure and computing capacity will enable innovative research endeavors that will leverage public publicly funded research. But I will say the promise is great, but creating a new and robust ecosystem to support data management, sharing, 
and reuse will take time, investment and consistent dedicated effort at the institutional, provincial and national levels. I am very proud of the progress we are making at the University of Guelph through the Alliance, including instituting data management plans for agri-food research and implementing new data infrastructure like the data access portal that we'll hear about today. We are committed to research data stewardship based on fair principles, making data findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. And we do recognize that there is a significant gap between where we are now and where we would like to be ideally. This current iteration of the Research Center Data, Center data Access Portal is part of an evolving initiative the access portal is an important step in enhancing data stewardship. It is a scalable unit upon which we will base other data initiatives, which is why events like this are critical to gather as an agri-food community to discuss progress, promise, challenges and opportunities presented by research data initiatives. During today's presentations, you'll hear from three experts, Dr. Rosita Dara, Dr. Christine Bays and Dr. Katie Wood, who are poised to talk about the progress, promise, challenges and opportunities as we continue to advance data initiatives for the benefit of Ontario's agri-food sector. Then the second half of the webinar will be a panel discussion with questions submitted by participants upon registering for the event. There will also be an opportunity to ask questions during today's event by the Q&A function, you can add a question at any time to be asked during the discussion. So now with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Rosita Dara, Associate Professor in the School of Computer Science, University of Guelph. Dr. Dara will start things off by providing an overview of the research station data access portal, including how it was developed, what progress has been made and what the next steps and future uh, potential are. Over to you, Rosita. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you very much, Bev, for the introduction. Um, uh, thank you very much, everyone, for attending my talk uh, for uh, this session, this webinar. Um, so I want to start off by uh, sharing my slides first. <laughs> uh, so maybe uh, give me a second. I'll start by saying uh, thank you very much for attending uh, today's webinar. What I would like to share with you uh, is the experience we accumulated over the past few years for establishing this data platform that we have um, that we have built uh, for the University of Guelph and Laura, I would say, uh, and for both dairy and beef. And now we have added some crop data uh, research stations. Uh, as I'm sure many of you would agree with me, the rate of development of technology far exceeds the rate of its adoption. And when the new technologies are adopted, it takes time to embrace it by the user. And once the users start adopting uh, and embracing it, it's time for a new technology to replace it. So we need to, so ultimately this impact how technology is used for making things more eff efficient and how uh, it's used as part of the decision-making process. Given the fast pace of uh, changing technology, we should act fast, um, uh, you know, as much as possible. Uh, so in our, uh, so this, uh, our research stations that we have built that are quite hot, uh, high tech, they are not, they are no different. We have had some best technology incorporated in our beef, dairy, in the future swine, um, research stations, we truly believe that the technology here uh, could be leveraged, um, leveraged uh, sustain, uh, sustainably uh, for research projects addressing industry-based or applied and industry-relevant questions. Uh, however, like most other cutting-edge technologies, there are many complexities, which I will talk about it very briefly today. Uh, in how they can be used the be uh, uh, to the best of their capacity. One of the main issues that we faced since day one was how to capture data, how to standardize data, which is still we haven't gotten there, how to make it accessible to the users, uh, which for now they are, uh, I mean, our researchers. These issues uh, gave us uh, the motivation to embark on the project that I'll be describing here. 
and uh, our my colleagues Kate and Katie and Christine will uh, talk about the applications of using uh, such technologies and this data platform. Just briefly about myself, uh, I'm a uh, sorry, I um, I'm a faculty member member as Bev uh, indicated at the School of Computer Science. I have also I. Uh, uh, you know, it has been a few years that I have been working with Alliance um, as uh, RPD, uh, Research Program Director, or Data Strategy Director, uh, looking after our uh, research station's data. Uh, a brief uh, comment about my background. Uh, so I'm in computer science. I have worked previously at BlackBerry. I have worked at Information Privacy Commission's office. At BlackBerry, I worked on interoperability for mobile health data. Uh, I have worked on privacy and security as well, but my core background is AI, so I'm quite familiar with the, with the um, data uh, lifecycle, uh, data management and privacy governance. And when I joined in 2013, the University of Guelph, I established a lab, a lab for data management and privacy governance. So many of the challenges that we experienced through the uh, development of this data platform, I was very familiar with, and I was expecting that, you know, this will be the challenges and, uh, and how they should be addressed. So um, I was uh, I got involved in um, when Dairy Research Station was being built. I mean, almost close to the end when they were buying equipment. As somebody who has technical background, to sit in a committee and um, talk about the, these smart, basically sensors and devices that uh, we were purchasing. Uh, I have talked to uh, uh, Professor Rich Mokia at the time about data governance and data management, basically. But then, um, and I took the liberty to just, uh, you know, reach out to uh, our farm kind of uh, managers, uh, to several researchers and few people who were involved in that committee at that time to, to find out whether we have a kind of a plan for, for managing the data. Uh, so um, I realized that we didn't have uh, an actual like, kind of an actual plan in place to to manage uh, to collect and make data accessible at, at the very basic um, this the data that was being generated at uh, dairy uh, research station. Um, then uh, so my observation when I was interviewing people and then it was confirmed when uh, later on I started as a RPD working on this. Um, I realized that there are many issues, uh, many challenges we had to address. Obviously, data wasn't being collected in a structured manner. Um, some uh, devices were collecting data on, on the device, on a USB, some, were, uh, some data was being sent to the cloud. Um, so the challenges were enormous. The data was being overwritten. Uh, we were losing some of that data, at least uh, if it was on the cloud, we could access it, but if it was only on the device, it was a challenge, uh, so researchers had to drive there to collect data. Um, access to raw data was limited. Access to metric was a little bit easier. Um, there were many tables that are being generated that we weren't aware of until we get access to the you know uh, technology providers cloud. So there are there were many. So basically, data wasn't being managed in a, a kind of a, in a structured way the way it should have been. Um, so uh, that was a, a great opportunity for me. I, I created a report once uh, Dr. Bev Hale took over uh, the, the position currently. Uh, I spoke with her and her vision was, I mean, she spoke with me. Her vision was aligned with mine in terms of the important, importance of collecting data. Uh, you know, uh, so just everything you see on the list, uh, my apologies if my list uh, is too long, but I think it's not enough, I can add more. Uh, so uh, it, it, when you collect data in a kind of a structured manner, if uh, when you care about high quality data, it obviously helps with ensuring research excellence. High quality data obviously is, is needed for research for any purposes when you use uh, modeling. Um, data share, sharing, uh, replication, reuse, it was absolutely critical. So without having a platform, none of these could have been enabled. I mean, faculty members had to go to the research station, collect the data in most cases, bring it back to the lab, uh, clean it, and spend sometimes manually because, uh, you know, uh, maybe they didn't have the tools to process, write query, and uh, clean the data. 
So, uh, and then data security, obviously the way it was uh, being managed, data security wasn't insured and, and many, other, um, many other issues. And um, so, so we agreed on, you know, starting a prototype project together um, to just, um, you know, so, so we started thinking about, okay, what can be done with the research station, uh, research station the technology, the data that we have. So we decided to, uh, on some long-term, I mean, I developed some long-term and short-term goals. Um, and just to look at, first of all, give access to the data. Uh, during our uh, discussion with the faculty members, we realized obviously data access was a very important issue, uh, obviously, to be able to easily get access to the data, um, get access to the cloud and be able to easily collect data rather than doing uh, many of the steps manually, um, enhance data quality, enable data aggregation, access to raw data, which wasn't available because of the volume of raw data, they couldn't store the data on on the device and uh, creating standards, guidelines, um, the possibility of uh, creating real-time dashboard for farm managers, which we have done uh, right now for them to in help them make better decisions uh, faster, uh, you know, those sort of things. These, are, these were some long-term goals. We have been able to achieve some. In terms of the short-term goal, we decided to have a start a prototype project which I'm very glad to inform you that it has been fine. At, at least we are in the maintenance phase. Um, so we wanted to do all some of the things that were our low hanging fruit, understanding who are the stakeholders, what their needs are, uh, what are the technical challenges, which were plenty. I mean, getting access, um, finding out about IP addresses, getting access to cloud, working with the technology providers, with the, working with the farm managers, which they were great, very supportive. And be, because of, their help, we are here right now. Uh, but there were lots of things that we had to do uh, to be able to just simply put the platform, bring data from research station to, uh, to the servers and back it up and secure it. Um, so given my experience uh, working in industry, I'm very familiar with software development lifecycle. Uh, I got the funding, thank you very much to Elias and support. Uh, uh, we got, uh, they provided me help to uh, recruit students, which was, this was a great opportunity for our computer science students. Um, they got hand, hands-on experience with, with a, an actual real world problem. And uh, so I tried to uh, kind of go through the uh, standard industry practice to develop this um, platform. And uh, so, so now we have a platform. I don't want to go through the challenges, but the data processing, you know, uh, creating data backup, uh, the cleaning data was an absolutely challenge because nobody, even I think that even the, uh, the technology provider didn't pay attention to some of the tables that they were creating. So we had to work with them to clean up the tables to bring it to our research farm. So it was a quite a, <laughs> extensive effort so we have had over five um, uh, co-ops and one of them turned he graduated and he became kind of a junior developer who is currently working with us as uh, right now uh, but um, so uh, yeah basically we get the data at the farm we have bought a server uh, and data gets collected every day from all the cloud servers everywhere and uh, not only the far, uh, data that is uh, that we have at the farm, we are working with DFO. DFO sends the data to the email. We have written a script that gets the data, downloads it to the to our server. So we have found many different ways to to get that data. And every night it sends it to University of Guelph um, uh, uh, servers, secure servers that are provided by CCS. And uh, success. So we have a web portal that gives access to uh, researchers. Uh, we have also added the uh, kind of um, uh, crop data. It's um, uh, an experiment which apparently has been done for 40 years. Uh, somebody had already cleaned the data, but uh, our, uh, it is everything is being uploaded by the manager uh, because it's um, there are no way that we can get access to cloud and collect it automatically. Uh, so now we have the platform, we have the data, and we are constantly adding data to, to our platform. We have built it in a way that is expandable. It accepts all sorts of data. Quite a bit of extensive time has been spent on 
data filtering to make it as, as uh, uh, robust as possible. Um, and uh, this year we worked on website accessibility. Um, so as you can imagine, working with co-ops, they had to do lots of learning on their own and with me. So um, yeah, so that has been, uh, so that's done uh, to, to a great extent. So basically so far, I mean, we have had success, which is great. Um, we have a data platform, which is right now in the uh, kind of uh, maintenance stage, um, you know, uh, which me meaning that we constantly improve the platform, call, add more data, but basically we have over 50 users. I, I mean, it could be way more, but that's maybe kind of an old stat. Um, and so if, if you are interested, anybody is interested, I mean, uh, the University of Guelph interested to get access to our platform, I'll be happy to show it. Uh, we have done some aggregation of data as well uh, in collaboration with our faculty members. It hasn't, it wasn't extensive, but that has already been done to get the raw data aggregated in a way that's usable for them uh, and for their research and for their students. So as a next step, uh, what we are doing currently is uh, something that both Bev and I, uh, Dr. Bev Hale and I were very excited about. It was to work on, okay, we are collecting the, this data Nobody knows what they, this data is. I mean, to a great, I mean, technology provider, they may have an idea when they were collecting it, but we want to put scientific and very well defined definition for the data. Again, thank you very much with the support from Alliance uh, to enhance. Uh, I mean, there are lots of benefits of creating metadata. You know, it's just uh, you have the uh, kind of a harmonized definition. Um, you know, uh, then you have, you agree on the source, you agree on the format. You understand how all the data are related to each other if, if it is done so, uh, at a sophisticated level. <clears throat> it, this requires a lot of engagement from, from the community. So we have reached out to the community and they have agreed to help to work with us and also our farm managers. So <clears throat> this project is currently ongoing and at least the definitions should be done, uh, finished in a month and a half for all the data we are collecting. <clears throat> my, my apologies. And uh, so basically we are at the stage that with all the data sources we have collected, we are now defining the, the data attributes. And, uh, and uh, uh, so that's, uh, that's the stage we are. Um, so this uh, metadata creation would be through involvement of the researchers, of the community, looking at the data definition. It would be kind of crowdsourcing effort. Um, looking at the literature, because my RA, she has, a, she has an AI background, um, she's leading, reading lots of literature, understanding some of the concept behind this data, and she's putting the definition, but then we will validate everything we have done with the researchers. This would be, this metadata will be um, stored on Dataverse, but we want to link it to the data platform we have, so that when faculty members, they go, <clears throat> they download the table, they can download metadata and definitions at the same time. Um, so we are thinking of developing a sophisticated uh, metadata management and link it to the, the to our platform. At this stage, we want to keep it simple because, you know, we want to move to the next uh, phase and many other exciting things that can be done. But these metadata and data platforms could be quite sophisticated if, if it is needed, but we have to really uh, do a kind of uh, environmental scan and an interview with the uh, end users uh, who are researchers, at least basically at this point, and farm managers to see whether it's needed that level of sophistication. Um, so uh, uh, I hope I'm not too over time, but uh, so what's next? Uh, I would say sky is the limit, uh, but we have to see what's feasible, the cost and everything uh, for us to uh, take on a large uh, initiative. But um, the, given that we are, we will be having, we have a fiber optic in this area, uh, in that area, we can think big about, you know, using that platform, uh, you know, that uh, research station as, um, you know, kind of, um, uh, kind of IoT infrastructure. And also we can enhance real time data aggregation and access if it is needed. I'm not sure if it will be. I haven't got a sense from our researchers that that's needed, but that definitely can be done building data infrastructure, we can optimize data integration and processing to the extent that faculty members, they just need to download it and use it for their own, because right now they have to go through several steps to aggregate, you know, pre-processing before modeling. We can try to see what's the sweet spot that we can help 
uh, our faculty members to get there so that they can download and use the data, especially if they don't have programming uh, their, within their HQP programming skills. Um, yeah, we can focus on the data because it's quite valuable and it's being generated there. We can you know, uh, optimize the dashboard for data managers. And uh, after that, it could be modeling algorithms and extracting new knowledge, uh, which I'm not sure would be the, uh, whose response are probably researchers would be taking over of the, that work. Um, so anyway, this was a very short overview of what we have done so far, um, but obviously there is room for improvement for building a better platform uh, and working, at engaging, you know, kind of bringing the data scientists on board to help us with improving metadata, enhancing, enabling data standardization, which is a very extensive effort and uh, also helping faculty members with um, their analytics needs if it is needed. So again, sky is the limit. Uh, uh, we can do, um, we can take this initiative to the next stage, but, uh, but, uh, but it requires a lot of effort. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Rosita, for your presentation. And I have to say, personally, I really enjoy working with you. I love the sky's the limit. It sounds wonderful. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Christine Bays, Associate Professor in the Department of Animal Bioscience at the University of Guelph and Canada Research Chair in Livestock Genomics. Dr. Bays will discuss how efforts to consolidate, organize, and improve access to research data from the Ontario Dairy Research Centre, including the Data Access Portal that you've just heard about, supports uh, their research program. Dr. Bays will also comment on the future potential that the Data Access Portal provides for their research portfolio. Over to you. Thank you, Bev. It is uh, indeed my pleasure to uh, tell you a bit about one of the research projects currently running at the Ontario Dairy Research Centre in Elora. Our project focuses on enhancing dairy industry sustainability and improving dairy cattle resilience. Um, and it also relies very heavily on data from the research centre. <clears throat> So dairy cattle generally are given a, a bad rap often for their contribution to greenhouse gases. In particular, ruminants, ruminants have been identified as a considerable source of methane. Um, but cows are not as inefficient as one may think. As you can see from this graph, um, the number of cows in Canada um, and the amount of milk that they produce is, uh, is shown here over time. And in 1960, uh, we needed about 3 million cows to produce about um, 80 million hectoliters of milk. Now today, uh, we're producing the same amount of milk, um, amazingly, with only one third of the number of cows. Uh, so we, we are actually quite efficient. But the, the pressure to keep improving efficiency and increasing societal concern about dairy's contribution to greenhouse gases provides the opportunity for the dairy industry and the research community to uh, keep investigating how we can make uh, dairy even better than it is. In 2015, uh, Drs. Uh, Filippo Miglior, Flavio Schenkel and Paul Stothard um, launched the Efficient Dairy Genome Project, um, a project that was funded by Genome Canada and various industry partners with the goal of creating an international database for feed efficiency and methane emissions. This project made the successful launch of a novel national genomic evaluation for feed efficiency possible just last month through uh, our main industry partner, Lactanet. Um, building on the results of this project, a second project funded by Genome Canada and many, many national and international partners was launched in 2020. And this project has a number of uh, very important objectives. Uh, the first one being improving the overall resilience in dairy cows. And we've defined resiliency as the capacity of an animal to adapt rapidly to changing environmental conditions while becoming more environmentally efficient and without compromising its productivity, its health or its fertility. So those are, those are quite lofty goals. Um, 
to do this, we uh, are identifying new female fertility traits uh, using automated sensor data. We're improving health traits by broadening uh, the, the phenotypes um, regarding resistance to disease. So we're including Yodin's disease, leukosis, respiratory diseases, and calf health traits into the national evaluation eventually. And we're further improving uh, environmental efficiency by enlarging the reference population for feed efficiency and methane emission traits that was initially developed in the Efficient Dairy Genome Project. With 42 national and international research partners, this uh, $12.5 million project represents the dairy industry's approach to improving the resilience and resiliency of dairy cattle around the world. Um, the question now is, how do we attain such a lofty goal? Uh, genomic technologies have been a proven solution in dairy cattle in Canada, and they are now widely implemented in the industry. But these technologies require very, very high quality trait information or phenotypes, and this is a real challenge. So our solution is to incorporate data collection from sensors and technology including those at the Ontario Dairy Research Centre with other international efforts to address this goal. And the overarching goal of this project is to provide Canadian dairy farmers with a genomic selection index um, for resiliency by 2024. So as previously mentioned, there are three main phenotyping activities in our project. Uh, they include the development of novel fertility traits, um, health traits, as well as a continued effort to increase the reference population for feed efficiency and methane. These uh, phenotyping activities will flow into sort of an engine of the project, and that consists of activities on genotype environment interactions, um, epigenetic effects and data management, which will incorporate all of these new um, phenotyping efforts into um, usable information. There is, uh, as this is a Genome Canada large-scale applied research project, there's also an activity on the societal influence on, on breeding decisions, and finally the translation and implementation of the results um, to genomic breeding values for efficiency. And this step is uh, being done by, again, our our partner Lactonet. So I will now focus on how the data collected from the Ontario Dairy Research Centre contributes to the first three activities of this project. As you can imagine, our experimental design uh, requires numerous types of data collected at different stages of an animal's life. So you can see here listed, we have just a few um, of the, the types of data that we're looking at calf health, weight, feed intake, um, genotypes of the animals. So we take a hair sample and, and we analyze the DNA in that hair sample. We have uh, milk yields and the, the contents of the milk. So things like fat and protein, somatic cell score, um, beta hydroxybutyrate, near spectra, et cetera. These data are collected uh, in the milking facilities there and analyzed through um, Lactonet as well. Uh, we're collecting automated uh, information on body condition scores and weights. So the animals run over a scale every time that they're milked. You can see, maybe you, maybe you can't see, but here there is a picture of a cow that looks um, like she's uh, hyper color, but that's just uh, a body condition score um, being automatically generated for her. And we're, we're trying to in incorporate those, uh, those data points um, and connect them to that individual animal. Of course, when we're talking about feed efficiency, we need to know about feed intake and feed components. So we are using the, um, the RIC system that is installed at Elora, and we are uh, using all of those uh, weekly feed, feed analyses. Um, all of that data is flowing into this project. Furthermore, we have um, information on activity and rumination of animals, efficiencies, but also for the fertility and health um, activity of, uh, of course, the collection of methane emissions at the Allora Dairy. Now, this uh, information, as you can see, um, is coming from really different sources. Uh, here you might see a, a collar on a calf. 
um, or a, a Fitbit on a cow's leg, or we have some kind of a bin. And you, you can imagine that the, the information coming from that is, um, is in all different formats, as you can, as you can see here. So this, this is absolutely a, a huge opportunity. And our, uh, the, the data access portal that Rosita has mentioned, it facilitates access to all of this data. Um, pipelines and software development can now automate the, the consolidation of this data. And of course, a huge opportunity is that this approach can be mirrored for other animal species, uh, as well as plant or soil data. So the, we have actually the optimal use of a valuable and unique resource right here at our doorsteps. And there are many, many more opportunities from this as well. But as you can also probably imagine, there are also challenges with this types of type of data. There is a, a large variation in the format of different technologies. Um, not all of the data is available yet. And there is really a multidisciplinary approach required for these pipelines, for the development of these pipelines, for the software um, around these pipelines, and for the visualization of that data. Um, we've seen already that in, in my personal group, we have uh, a number of people working on this, uh, Carrie Houlihan, Lucas um, Lopez, Lucas Alcantara, uh, are just to name a few of the students working directly with this, um, with this data. Um, it is really difficult because we need a lot of different people with different skills to, to put it all together. One thing that's also very important is technology is fallible. Um, there are mice at Elora and they might chew through a cable. I don't think that happens very often, but, but close monitoring of these automated systems is absolutely necessary and um, required for use of this data. Uh, the biological relevance of each data point has to be carefully evaluated. And there are many, many other challenges, but um, the, the prize is large because just in terms of this project alone, we have identified a number of uh, tangible deliverables to our end users. And those end users include Canadian dairy producers, the Canadian society, Canadian consumers, and Canadian companies. Um, there is the opportunity here to save farmers an estimated $252 million per year after four years. Um, we can uh, reduce our cumulative emissions at a, um, at a rate of about uh, 11,000 tons of CO2 equivalents per year. And we can ensure the availability of nutritious and affordable uh, dairy products to Canadian consumers. And finally, uh, dairy actually does com contribute quite a large uh, portion to uh, the GDP and uh, Canadian companies can um, benefit from this type of project through increased sales nationally and internationally, as well, as, well as providing Canadian access to um, world leading genetics. Just very quickly, uh, some future opportunities uh, with data from the research centers and our data access portal. And this is more of a, a dream, sort of our department. I've borrowed some of these slides from uh, Dr. John Kant from the Department of Animal Biosciences. You can see here a graphic uh, representation of data collection uh, coming from different sources. And we have a single um, data organization point. Now, this is sort of where we're at right now. But once this is a little bit more established and a little bit more solid, uh, you can start to think about downstream analyses, such as routine uh, genome-wide association studies or pathway analyses, et cetera. Then depending on that, you can also think about uh, computer model, model developments, um, <clears throat> even including things like artificial intelligence or machine learning algorithms. Um, from that stage on, we can think about decision support systems and uh, for different types of systems as well. Uh, the, the picture just keeps getting more complicated, but ultimately what we're looking to do is to develop precision livestock management tools to help improve the, the health, the welfare and the productivity of our farm animals. So in summary, the Ontario Dairy Research Center provides data for large scale, multidisciplinary and industry relevant research. Um, technological advances will increase the variety, the velocity and the volume of data. That's a, a real definition of big data. 
And the data portal provides a, a much needed home for our data. We still need um, to do some uh, more development on getting the data into the data portal and then cleaning it, as Rosita mentioned. But it's, it's there. And the goal to combine genetic, physiological, and behavioral data on each animal is, uh, is a very, very important one. So we're on our way, but there is absolutely a lot left to do. With that, I would like to thank all of the funding organizations and industrial support. A huge shout out to my team of uh, extremely dedicated students who have made this work all possible. If you're interested in more information, please check out our website. And with that, I would like to finish. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christine. That's a great overview and uh, description of a very complex project and congratulations to you for landing that. Um, with that, I'd like to uh, now say last but certainly not least in our uh, presentations, we have Dr. Katie Wood. Dr. Wood is an assistant professor in the Department of Animal Biosciences at the University of Guelph. And Dr. Wood will be discussing similar topics to those of Dr. Bayes, but from the perspective of her uh, research portfolio uh, in beef production. Thank you very much. Over to you, Katie. Thanks, Beth. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I, again, thank the organizers for inviting me to talk about uh, beef research and how harvesting data and data collection uh, will help the beef industry. So um, on, uh, like the dairy, we're actually in a really pinnacle point of transition at the Beef Research Center. Uh, we have recently undergone extensive renovations to the facilities and are really at the, the, the springboard to kind of a new uh, era in, in beef research here in, in Ontario. And so for those of you that don't know, the, the facility is essentially brand new. Um, we opened the cow-calf barn um, just in the fall of 2019. And um, the pasture has been undergoing renovations for the past uh, two years um, with the east half opening uh, last summer and the western half um, being completed uh, in its complete renovations in uh, 2021 this, this summer, as well as uh, new extensive renovations to the feed center. Uh, in addition to uh, the cow-calf barn and the pasture, uh, we also have a feedlot that has been completely uh, reconstructed and it is in fact not yet open. So it'll be uh, opening up uh, later this fall. And so you can imagine here with a, a research facility that kind of expands right across the supply chain. We have a cow-calf uh, facility as well as a feedlot facility. Um, that means at full capacity, um, we could have as many as almost 600 animals um, at the facility at a time. So if you can imagine uh, the type of data that we can generate from 600 animals uh, on a daily basis, um, that can be quite large and quite extensive. And so the need to be able to manage that data um, is really uh, important to the quality of the research as we've heard today from Rosita and, and Christine as well. So we'll share a little bit about where we are now. And certainly, um, as I mentioned, uh, with the, the new construction and the new facilities, um, this is very much a starting point. And so um, myself, I'm a, a nutritionist. I, I work a lot on uh, feed efficiency and improving efficiency of production uh, across the, the beef value chain. And so um, as a nutritionist, one of my really important tools of course, is to measure feed intake. Um, of, of course, it's not just related to nutrition. It's kind of a pinnacle measurement um, as one of those key phenotypes, as Christine mentioned, um, that is important to uh, improve efficiency of production. 
And so currently at the, at the bee facility, we uh, have all of our feed intake data um, being recorded onto the portal um, at, in a near real-time basis. And so for us, um, this includes, of course, uh, feed intake, which is just a, a weight measurement. Uh, but more importantly, um, with this type of technology, we're able to dive a little bit deeper into that. And so not only do we look at sheer intake, um, but we can also look at important questions relating to feeding behavior, um, as well as we've been using the system um, for animal health purposes. So uh, for example, um, currently we're running a feed project uh, in the feedlot, looking at how different rations impact gut health. Um, and certainly we can use the new, new real time, near real time uh, capacity of the septic uh, system to help identify and be um, subject to some, some gastrointestinal distress, for example. So if they start to go off feed or reduce their feed intake, um, certainly we can, uh, my students can uh, monitor those animals um, to see how they are doing and performing and maybe to even identify early on uh, any adverse health effects. And so um, certainly another benefit of, of having this technology and this platform um, that can be accessed um, easily by students and myself as well as, as our whole research team. Uh, in addition, uh, the Incentec installation, which are these uh, uh, feeding systems here, uh, with once the feedlot is completed, uh, we will be uh, one of the largest installations, if not the largest, of this type of feeding system in the world. And certainly that puts us at a, a unique advantage because we can uh, capture our data on an individual animal basis. And so certainly Christine mentioned um, that goal towards precision agriculture, um, certainly moving from pen experiments where you're feeding uh, animals in a pen and you're not really identifying um, their needs on an individual animal basis. Uh, we're moving away from that approach and to more that precision agriculture uh, approach uh, with this type of system. So certainly we can see that as a trend in agriculture and certainly using this technology for research um, now will help us uh, train those tools and use those tools um, so that we can um, uh, make um, uh, code of practices and best management practices for that uh, precision uh, feeding of those, those animals. Now, as I mentioned, the, the station is fairly new. Uh, so we do have uh, uh, many other systems that we hopefully will see on the portal um, eventually. So uh, like Christine mentioned with the dairy, there are lots of different data capture systems and we're working to integrate um, those platforms uh, onto the data access portal. So as you can imagine with all the different technologies, they uh, each speak different languages, so to speak. And so to integrate them onto one platform sometimes can be a bit of a challenge. And so certainly uh, in the near future, we hope to be adding uh, all our production records data. So um, that's including uh, uh, data from, from animal health, um, any of the breeding or pedigree records, um, as well as any cattle management and performance records uh, onto that data access portal. Um, like Christine mentioned with her dairy genome uh, project and the efficient uh, uh, dairy genome project, uh, we are also measuring greenhouse gas, gas data on our animals. So um, unlike dairy cattle, which are in, in the barn most of the year, uh, we have a unique challenge of having to balance both on pasture systems as well as in the barn. And so our methane uh, data systems look a little bit different. They're actually mounted on a trailer um, that is powered by our sol a solar panel. And so um, we don't need to be around uh, electricity to run uh, that type of, of data. And, um, and certainly that data can be stored in the cloud and hopefully will be uh, integrated into our access portal as well. Uh, as well as there's lots of opportunity for, for other data to be added. Uh, certainly one that I'm very interested in is making sure that we integrate our meat quality data 
Um, certainly, we're unique here in Guelph that we're able to do complete farm to fork uh, research on the beef side. And so making sure that we are capturing um, the characteristics of, of the end product, the product makes it to the consumer, uh, is also very important as well. And so uh, being able to include that uh, on that database uh, certainly will be an advantage to us. Uh, as well, um, I have any new technologies there. Um, certainly, there are always new sensors, new visual um, data type systems that are being developed. And uh, certainly, um, as those come online, and, and even if they're in the prototype stage um, that we ourselves are working on, uh, we hope to be able to add uh, that data to the portal as well as part of um, the development and advancement uh, for uh, improving production in the beef industry. So similar to uh, Christine, uh, I was asked to talk a little bit about what we saw, see the value for um, this type of data capture for beef production and for beef research. And certainly uh, the biggest one that comes to mind is uh, this data enables us to ask more challenging questions. So a lot of what I do now is, is kind of project-based work, right? We're evaluating one diet or one feed additive or something like that. Um, but certainly those are kind of the lower hanging fruit uh, type projects. Um, and particularly in the beef industry where we're dealing with maybe longer term um, production cycles, um, being able to answer questions um, that maybe falls outside of the three to five year grant cycle um, can be really, really important. So a perfect example of this is pasture work. Um, so if we're looking at monitoring soil carbon, for example, uh, in pasture systems, um, that is something that uh, is not likely going to change over from in a short term period, um, but maybe we can uh, investigate that over the 10 or 20 year period. And so um, archiving that data and having that data um, will certainly en enable us to uh, do some of those longer term projects. Uh, certainly another challenge with, with the beef industry is uh, ensuring that we see data flow along the supply chain. And so uh, in the beef industry, it's much more segmented where we have our cow-calf producers that are often separate from our feedlot producers, which are often separate from our uh, packing plants. And so um, making sure that we can get data from one end of the supply chain uh, to the other to make informed decisions for management and production um, is, is a, a real challenge in the beef industry. And certainly if we have that data available to us uh, on the research scale, at least, um, we could able, hopefully enable um, improving that uh, uh, data flow and ensuring that we're making uh, management decisions uh, and uh, coming up with research questions um, to address the whole supply chain, not just the different segments of the supply chain. Uh, and as Christine mentioned as well, kind of stole a little bit of the slide that I maybe was going to share, um, but certainly this lets us look at some of the the more broad systems based uh, questions. So whether that be some deep learning and machine learning type questions to develop models, uh, meta-analysis and, and things like that um, to, to enable to uh, apply some of those, that data on a much larger scale. In addition, um, certainly benchmarking change is another really important factor. So uh, the beef industry, again, one of the challenges that we, we see um, is certainly relating to things like environmental impact of beef production. Again, that's not something that you can change overnight with necessarily one project-based experiment, um, but certainly if we capture that data and we can monitor the, those changes over the long period, um, that can uh, certainly be valuable uh, in order to kind of quantify the improvement um, that we make through innovation. Uh, in addition, I, th I think this, the storage of this data certainly enhances research value and return on investment for our partners. And so um, perhaps um, uh, in depending on the, of course, uh, uh, scope of the project, um, replicating data capture might not be a good value for investment. And so if we, if we have that data value, 
available to us in a, in a database. Um, certainly that increases our animal number and can reduce um, the variability that we see and so that we are able to make more accurate predictions and more accurate recommendations across a larger um, uh, scope of, of the industry. And so uh, it makes research uh, value go further. In addition, uh, for example, using our Incentex systems, I mentioned moving from pen-based studies to individual-based studies. Um, certainly that can help reduce research costs even at the animal level. And so uh, previously without that type of technology, if we were looking to measure feed intake, um, we would need to measure that on a pen scale. And so maybe you have uh, 15 or 20 animals within a pen. Um, whereas we, to get the same experimental power, um, we would need only 20 or so individuals instead of 20 times maybe five or six pens to get that same uh, level of experimental power um, from those same number of animals. Uh, as well, uh, and Rosita talked a lot about this, was to increase data accuracy. So certainly, traditionally, right, um, a lot of the data input was manual. And so with human error, um, certainly that can uh, uh, decrease the accuracy of that data. And so uh, research integrity and quality uh, can be improved by using some of these automatic uh, collection systems. Plus we can introduce um, algorithms to maybe flag uh, unusual um, inputs and, and, and act as a second or, or tertiary check um, to ensure that we're having the most accurate and most valuable um, data as possible. And so uh, uh, this type of system can be really advantage, advantageous uh, for us um, in, the, in that regard. Plus it is generally a little easier to use rather than having to learn data processing on maybe 15 different inputs. Um, uh, we can do this all centrally through um, the data portal. And uh, with that, I think uh, I finished off our little summary here and I will turn it back over to Bev um, where we can move into the discussions. Thank you very much, Katie. That was a great presentation. And I want to take a moment to uh, thank all of our presenters because everything uh, uh, was really nicely said. And I do want to um, say one commonality among all of these presentations, I think, is that they really highlight the return on the investment by the province and the sectors in investing in these facilities, investing in the upgrades, um, and their continued operation. And, and I think that's been demonstrated very, very amply in these presentations. Um, I'm gonna ask now Dr., uh, Dr. Wood, Dr. Bayes and Dr. Dara to turn their cameras back on. Um, and when you're responding to a question, if you could also please unmute yourself. We have prepared some questions for the panel discussion based on um, uh, those that were submitted by the registrants at the time that they registered for this webinar. Uh, we won't be able to get to them all, but we have picked some of the ones that had uh, many common elements. Um, so I'm going to go uh, to those. And then after we have done those, we will open up uh, to the ones that are in the Q&A. And I see that uh, some of our panelists have already answered some of the questions that are in the Q&A and everybody I understand can see those um, answers. So if we start, first of all, with the panel questions, um, why is harvesting data from on-farm technology important? How is it impacting research now? We've had some sense of that. Somebody like to tackle that one? Well, I guess, uh... I think it would be good if one of my colleagues who work on the application to talk about this. But as I mentioned in my presentation, uh, I think, uh, uh, you know, uh, harvesting data from the research station, why is it important? Obviously, it helps advance research. Um, you know, it, it will give us opportunity to manipulate data however we want and, uh, you know, extract uh, new knowledge and information from the data, new ways of managing farm new ways of improving animal health and uh, 
uh, many other applications, but uh, but talking about how managing and cleaning and having this infrastructure is all about data quality um, and data access and uh, you know some of the benefits that I spoke in my research. But I will leave it to my colleague to comment more on this. Yeah, Katie, if you don't mind, I'll go. <laughs> I'll go. Yeah, you next. had your hand up there, Christine. So. So. Harvesting data from on-farm technology is not important. It's absolutely essential to remain relevant in today's world. There is no agriculture without data anymore. Um, and this is, we can't be a research station without being the best at having data. And, and if you visit farms across Ontario, um, we really have to keep ahead um, of them because they've got data systems as well. They might not be able to use their data as well. Um, and in the in the in the applications that we can in these large scale research projects, etc. But there is a, a need and a um, a huge push to become more efficient. Canada has, from a genetics standpoint, Canada has, has traditionally played a very large and active role in providing um, genetic material for other countries, and we're, we're very, very good at it. The reason we're good at it is because we have such fantastic phenotypes, and now we also have genotypes, which is um, really, really important for, for this type of, of, advance and, uh, of advanced selection programs. So, it's impacting research. I think, I think you've seen that it's impacting research. Um, it, it's, it's becoming embedded even into routine evaluations for the national evaluation. So I think it's, uh, yeah, I think it's really important. <laughs> yeah, I think one of my colleagues used to say, and he's a geneticist, so I'll forgive him for that, but uh, he says, um, if you can't measure it, you can't improve upon it. And so um, ensuring that we have that data and that accurate data is, is really, again, the way that we move forward and, and we can collect a lot of data and we can try and decide how we move forward. But um, without that data, we don't know where we're moving and don't know where we're going. So yeah, it's, it's absolutely critical for um, for agriculture, not just research, I think for agriculture in general. Thank you. And I do want to remind the audience that they can continue to put uh, questions in the Q&A and we will get to them. Um, another panel question, as many livestock farms continue to incorporate sophisticated, sophisticated on-farm technology, how can pooled data be leveraged to address a variety of challenges ranging from climate change to labor pool shortages. I think I'll, I'll start again. <laughs> um, the pool data is, uh, is required for uh, statistical reasons. If you have only one farm collecting data, um, that's fantastic for that farm but it doesn't hold any sort of conclusion that you make from, from results from that farm don't hold across the rest of, of the country. On top of that, um, there are lots and lots of different sensor uh, companies making different sensors that do similar but slightly different things at a similar or slightly different level of quality. So it's really the law of, of numbers here. You, science is based on, on um, not being able to disprove a hypothesis. So if, if you really want to uh, be able to disprove your hypothesis, you have to have the statistical numbers to back up whatever conclusion it is that you're making. And in order to do that, we really need large, um, large scale data collection across a number of different farms, for example, and also across a number of different uh, types of technologies to make sure that it's being validated and that it actually holds and is biologically relevant. Thank you. Yeah, um, just very similar comment. It's, a, it's about um, addressing the variation. So um, 
in a controlled experiment, variation can be maybe bad because we want to try and control as much of that as possible. But at the same time, understanding where that variation comes from um, is important to kind of identify ways maybe to move forward. And so um, certainly uh, broad types of, of systems um, throughout different uh, farms, different operations um, uh, may also enable us to find um, new research questions to ask and, um, and new, um, new ways to advance the industry. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask uh, a couple of questions that came in about the research station data access portal from registrants. Um, as, and I suspect this is going to be mostly for Rosita. As we continue to grow the research station data access portal and potentially expand data access to a broader audience, what are the one or two top data governance opportunities or challenges that we'll need to consider? Well, <laughs> Um, so, um, so data governance is a very complex uh, subject. Uh, it, it depends on the stakeholder. It depends on the existing processes. It depends on privacy or ownership concerns. And, you know, so, um, in terms of research data governance, I think for us, uh, so I can speak about that because one of the, one of my objectives was to tackle governance because it was my research. <laughs> that was, that was one of the main reasons I, I was interested in this project. So far we have simplified the project, uh, the, uh, the governance mainly because first of all, we didn't have access to data. So I had to focus on that. And, um, you know, first, um, then the next step would be into, you know, if, if, uh, and also we have research station data, which I assume the raw data could be, uh, shared with a larger group of, uh, researchers or, uh, stakeholders, partners, once we start processing data and if actually research data, I mean, I mean, research data by research data, I mean, the, re the data that my colleagues, researchers have processed and they have put their effort, HQP, their knowledge into it. We have to find a kind of smart ways and, uh, you know, to share it or make it accessible or inform others about what University of Guelph or uh, research platforms uh, include. At the same time, not sharing too much information and allowing, I'm a researcher myself and I understand researchers' concern. Uh, so one of the ideas that I spoke with uh, Dr. Bev Hill extensively was around metadata and, uh, you know, how we can develop metadata. I mean, I look at metadata as a way of preserving actually research data, but at the same time communicating what we have uh, in at the University of Guelph or what our researchers have uh, with the broader community, with, pub, uh, with uh, other researchers. Um, and enable at least uh, information communication uh, in terms of what we have and allow collaboration to start with uh, communicating at least metadata. I mean, you, if data about data, you know, not the actual data, but uh, data that we collect about the data sources that we have. Um, so in terms of data sharing, which is uh, one of the aspects of the governance, I think that would be the best approach uh, to move forward in a way that preserve everybody's, you know, respect researchers' uh, IP and uh, um, other aspects of governance. So we have data sharing, you, we have a stakeholders need. So this is something we have put quite a bit of an effort. Uh, funders need, you know, they may have their own restrictions around where the data can be stored, with whom it can be shared. So uh, in, as part of my research, we have looked at landscape of data agreements, um, which wasn't in the scope of this to talk about. But uh, for research, it's quite either you can't share it and you have to keep it within a very secure uh, servers and, you know, aggregate it and don't share it. You know, sometimes it's quite zero and one, quite simple. Um, so I would say if, if we narrow down sh governance to data sharing, uh, that was the metadata was one. And also met, uh, one of the uh, important things that for us is the next step as well is ontologies and taxonomies to enhance, um, you know, uh, uh, certain things regarding to uh, data management, which is uh, capturing data flow, uh, I mean, which is enhancing data flow, data integration, and those sorts of things. 
Um, again, we have been at early stages of data collection. We are looking into ontologies and taxonomies. That's another way of data governance if you think about interoperability, uh, semantic interoperability, and those sorts of things. So again, governance is quite complex. And we have looked into it, and we realize it's uh, it's uh, it would be we have to gradually address it. Thank you. Sorry, I need to unmute. Yes, so I've only done that once so far. That's really good for me. Uh, uh, Rosita, I'm just wondering. We have uh, I'm looking at the Q and A, and uh, for all of you, really, there have been uh, questions asked, and you have answered them. Uh, I'm not sure that everybody participating um, has had a chance to sort of read through the answers. Um, and I noticed the first question that was asked at 151 has not been tackled by anybody and maybe I'll take a bit of a stab at that one. Um, and then perhaps if we can uh, walk a little bit through them and see if there's anything else that you would, if you'd like to describe your answer and then see if you wish to add anything else. Um, I'd like to just take uh, the first question that was asked uh, from Phil Dick about, can you explain the commitment to skills and tools development it took to get for data management level today? Can you relate the ratio of cost to the data management system and the cost of ramping up the skills to any HR commitment of any effects operating costs? No, I can't. In, in, in straightforward terms, though, no, I can't uh, generate that right now. But certainly, one of the goals of this data portal access that Rosita has been working on and that uh, um, uh, Katie and Christine are talking about the benefits are, one of the purposes of that is to understand just how much it costs to get us to the various levels that we've achieved there. And that then becomes the scalable pilot essentially to help us understand how many more scalable pilots there are out there and, and what the kind of cost is going to be to, um, to get them all to the stage uh, that the um, beef and dairy data uh, access portal are. And, and one of the second examples that Rosita is working on is the uh, long-term uh, field trial, the crop uh, data. So there's another set of data that we need to understand how do we scale that up so people have availability. And I think as you, as you look at the demand and, and as we look at A, the demand for people attending the webinar as well as the questions, we know that the demand out there for this kind of data is very great and we share that. Um, and it's almost an infinite uh, demand and, and thus almost an infinite need for resources to support it. And of course there is no infinite source of resources. So we have to be very careful about where we target the resources to answer this need. So that's a rather long-winded answer to your question, what, considering I started off with no, the answer is no, I don't, I don't know yet. Um, but it is one of the goals of this pilot project to, to figure just that out so that we can understand uh, the, the, with the future needs that we're gonna have. So I'll stop talking there. Uh, Rosita, you've answered a few questions. Is there anything you'd like to um, uh, um, uh, sort of focus on or recap for the audience? Sure. Um, first of all, I want to answer Mike's question. If I, I think that's important to touch on uh, given the challenges of governance when it comes to um, research data. I'm not sure if I uh, understand this question exactly, whether it's about, you know, helping faculty members to put, say, you know, uh, about data and those sorts of things with, within their uh, grants and, uh, you know, applications, or if it is around IP. So I'm a researcher myself. I have, uh, you know, I have lot, tons of other things to do on top of this project. So I'm very cognizant about how much we use our researchers' time so, so far we have tried to, with the resources that the Alliance has provided us, we have tried to minimize, minimize, you know, just the burden from researchers and do most of the work ourselves, but they have been quite supportive in terms of giving feedback about the, uh, you know, data quality format and those sorts of things. We will need their help more for metadata and data, you know, that we will be generating, especially for livestock. Um, it, about IP, I mean, a, a lot of question comes up about data integration and because data integration, depending on the level of integration, that was one of the questions. At the very simple stage of cleaning, 
uh, which was our colleagues ask us, it's, you know, that's not an issue. There's no IP involved. You know, we understand that we can do it ourselves. If we want to go to the next step of aggregation, we require faculty members help. So one, th one idea that I have, uh, which also applies to my research, but, you know, kind of interoperability, but operational, to what stage we can clean the data so that the faculty members, they don't have to or help us integrate data in a way that is re data is better usable for all the uh, researchers, uh, most of the, our researchers, but at the same time, they don't have to contribute uh, their IP too much or they, have them, they don't need to put their research uh just uh, their entire find findings and research in front of us to process data they don't have to share that much but i think that sweet spot of data integration and cleaning will help our researcher to save time in terms of processing this is something i've heard from many colleagues that data processing and cleaning is very time consuming for them given that you know they don't have access to the type of hqp we have in computer science they know programming but at the same time they can download that data and then use it for their own research and they don't have to share if they don't want to. So that sweet spot we are still working on. I'm not sure if I answered your question. So as so we are not asking uh, our faculty members to change their personal structure or sharing their IP if they won't, don't want to. Even for metadata, we are doing all the work as much as possible. We are reviewing papers to define data. Then we will ask them to validate that information. So I'm not sure if I understood your question correctly, but that's, that would be my answer. Um, so uh, how are the data we collect would be useful? Uh, so I think if you focus on the raw data, having high quality as much as possible raw data and having a good definition and understanding of the relationship of the data among themselves, which, which are taxonomies and ontologies, that would be quite a contribution. We don't need to go to the extent of giving it to the machine learning. I mean, we can, but that would be my my colleague's research. So, uh, and it could be even my research, but that we will leave it for researcher because that would be part of their research. But giving access to high quality data, to some extent integrated in a way that's easily usable and uh, creating definition for the tables and for data attributes to me, that's a major contribution. So we, I think that's, that's what uh, that has been our goal so far. Um, so supply chain, deep science. Um, so um, yeah, sure. Go go ahead, Rosita. Yeah. So uh, food supply chain. Uh, I personally have worked on food data. You know, foodborne outbreak data. We have created ontology. Uh, that would be working with food science uh, a little bit, uh, kind of up the supply chain. So ab absolutely, I mean, if they are willing to work with us and they're willing to share data with us, uh, and, and I have to say our platform enables all sorts of access control. So if a faculty member, we have aggregated uh, data for some of our faculty members, it's their pure research. We have limited access to that group only. Obviously our database have that capability and we have ensured to, we have made sure that we are, you know, confidentiality and everything is preserved. Uh, so if there will be collaboration opportunities, which there may be uh, in the future, uh, we would welcome that, but not that at this point. Um, yeah, so I will let others <laughs> answer the rest, uh, but yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Rosita. I'm wondering if, uh, if um, Katie or Christine would like to tackle the question from Mike McMorris about change is mostly about people. And this is a big change. For example, a researcher today spends a lot of time applying for and then reporting on research funds while being rewarded in large part on publications. Simply having their data shared with everyone will require changes to the personnel structure for lack of a better phrase. These changes may make the IT challenges seem easy. How will the university make the needed changes to their uh, personnel structure? By which I think we mean faculty. That's a terrible and fantastic question all at the same time, because it's frightening to think about giving up your research. We work so we really do work very hard to get research proposals in and funded and, and successfully launched, etc. We our students rely on 
on faculty success for attaining research funds. Um, but at the end of the day, the data doesn't belong to the researchers. And we are constantly reminded of, of that because it is a, a public good. And if we can uh, share and play nice, then that's actually the goal that we should work towards. I think um, there are some situations where that, that can't be the case, of course, um, because of industry involvement or, or whatnot. But um, I think that it's possible, maybe I'm naive or too optimistic, uh, but I think that it's possible to develop a system that rewards researchers who might contribute in other ways. If, if you buy equipment, you might get, I don't know, some kind of credit point or something like that for purchasing data from the research station that you haven't actually been involved in collecting or something like this. But I think it's possible. And the resource is so great that we have at our disposal we should be thinking about elegant solutions to address this question because we can't afford not to. No researcher can do anything on their own. If they think they can, they are ignorant and wrong. <laughs> and it's, it's time, I think, to enter into this new era. It's exciting, it's frightening, but we have to work together. We, it, thinking about this, this, the development of data systems no person can do that alone. I don't know how to um, set a sensor or calibrate uh, an SCR tag. I do know how to download data from a database. I know a little bit of SQL programming, but ultimately we all need each other. And I need Laura right at the research station to put the collars on the cows. I need Gail uh, Ritchie at the research station to keep testing cows for methane. I need a, a huge army of students actually to collect data. And we also need a number of different um, experts. And if we can't share amongst ourselves, we have a much bigger problem. But we're working on it. I think one day at a time as this, as this resource becomes more and more shiny, uh, people will begin to uh, think about this differently, but it is a, it's a personal thing and those who are willing to share will, I hope, altruistically be benefited someday, <laughs> somehow. Thanks. Thank you, Christine. Katie, anything to add or is that really uh, covered it? No, I, th I, I think this is a really, really important question, uh, Mike, and something that I uh, initially struggled a lot with. Um, Certainly, one of the challenges is, again, who, uh, as someone who does a lot of project based research and is contributing a lot of phenotypes um, and has to compete for essentially the more expensive side to run the animal trials and to generate the data. Um, what is the value out of that? And I, and I think uh, Rosita talked a lot about uh, the metadata and the importance of that and building in uh, flexibility and definitions uh, and permissions into the system um, so that we can manage the data in any desirable way the researcher wants. And so if there are constraints on um, IP or delays that need to happen with IP, that's something that can be built in the system we don't need to not have a system because of these constraints. We just need to be able to manage around them. And, and, and I think the value of having that, that data outweighs maybe some of those maybe initial concerns. Um, but yeah, like, uh, on, the, on the, the people side, um, to use Christine's phrase, um, our students need to open their heart a little bit to programming. Um, certainly, the digital ag side is where agriculture is going. Um, we need programmers, but we also need people that that understand cows. And so um, trying to fill kind of that bridge is also really important. And so um, having the capacity and, and ability to have projects like this that kind of bridge that gap um, is is uh, also an extremely important training tool for our students, and um, and something certainly that that I can see being 
a really high value for, for the future. Thank you, Katie. And I'm not sure I could think of a better way to end uh, the presentations in the Q&A than uh, that shout out to the students and the need for, uh, for HQP. Um, uh, so at this point, I'm going to thank all the panelists and the audience for attending and reaching out to us uh, with questions. Um, I'd like to let the audience know that a webinar evaluation will be emailed out and we encourage uh, participants to complete the evaluation because we are planning more of these uh, events and so your feedback and what you want to see and hear in them would be very useful to make sure that we're hitting the mark. Uh, finally, if participants have any questions, they can contact uh, as follows, kttadmin, so k-t-t-a-d-m-i-n at uaguelph.ca. And with that, I'm going to say thank you to everybody and wish you all a good afternoon and evening. Thank you so much. Bye.